those of us who love the ocean, but sometimes feel helpless to make a difference, a recent event at the Birch Aquarium at Scripps gives hope. To kick off a month-long celebration of the fifth anniversary of Scripps Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, eco-journalist David Helvarg, author of The Blue Frontier, introduced his latest book, 50 Ways to Save the Ocean. Here is some of what he had to say. 97% of the living space of our planet is salt water. We, we terrestrials, we basically live between uh, the groundhog burrows and the tops of the trees where birds are nesting, maybe 300 feet of living space. The ocean has life from where turtles are munching jellyfish and too often plastic bags at the surface where the, the sharks have their dorsal fins exposed to seven miles down in the depth of the Marianas Trench where you have, uh, you've seen fish uh, on the one time that humans went to explore the deepest part of our ocean. And even today, we're still discovering new species of, of uh, wildlife out there, even as we're putting it at risk. And I think the hope is, is that, that people feel that connection. I mean, we get so much from the ocean in terms of, uh, you know, recreation and transportation and trade, protein, medicine, uh, security, and, and just that sense of awe and wonder of being part of something larger. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, we, we've created these cascading disasters that have occurred. We're, we're seeing, uh, you know, industrial overfishing for the global seafood market, where everything indigenous to the sea now has a market. You go to Fault in Fish Mark and there's skate wings and sea urchins and, and baby eels were getting $10 a pound a few years ago. The, the rate at which we're taking it out of the ocean, I mean, the, you know, we're taking 80 million tons of living biomass a year. So we're cementing it over, we're overfishing it, and uh, we're poisoning it with urban and agricultural runoff. For the most part, politicians are, are hardwired to their responses. They respond to money and they respond to votes. And if you don't have the money of, of the offshore oil and gas industry or the influence of the Navy, of commercial fishing interests, of coastal real estate developers, then you've got to do the other thing. You've got to go to all the people who love the ocean. Going, to the, going out to the beach is still the number one outdoor recreational activity for all Americans. And you gotta to talk to the 86 million people who go there every year, who as I say, get so much out of it, they wanna give something back. And uh, a lot, that's why we did the 50 ways to save the ocean. Because a lot of people I've talked to over the last three years, when you, when you talk about collapsing marine wildlife or climate change, they feel overwhelmed. You know, what can I do in my daily life? Well, you're doing something. Everything you do in your daily life impacts the ocean. The question is understanding, being conscious of how you have that impact and making choices that will work for the ocean and not against it. And not surprisingly, when you start looking at this stuff, the things you can do to save the ocean are also going to help save your life, help you save money. The, the number one thing is go to the beach. And why? Because you save what you love. I mean, there's so many things we can do every day. So you go to the beach and you take out everything you brought in and you bring a bag, you take the litter out. You don't let your dog chase the wildlife. You don't, you don't, you know, feed french fries to the gulls or, or peat the pelican. Diving etiquette and how to be a blue boater and, and things we don't think about relating to the ocean. You know, eating organic and vegetarian food. Uh, so, you don't, so you don't have the use of the petrochemicals that are being applied as, as pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. And also you, you eat locally and sustainably so that you're supporting local family-based farming. You don't have the long transportation lines. Uh, we talk about the Seaweed Rebellion. That's marine grassroots. That's organizing citizens to really make a demand on, on government and, and the political sector to uh, protect and restore our living seas. They're, they're our public seas, and they belong to all of us. And we have that sense of empowerment when we understand that it belongs to all of us, then we can really put the blue back in our red, white, and blue. We can protect it at a local level, state, regional, national, and global, because it's a global ocean. It's one world, and that world's blue.